everyone. I want to warmly welcome you to the Doheny Library. We haven't had our salon here for quite some time. Actually, never for me. We usually are in one of our boring classrooms. So I'm glad we got to get out of um, RGL. This is the Price Governance Salon, where we host faculty to explore issues related to effective governance ex and um, public management. And I wanted to, um, first of all, introduce you to what the salon is, but second of all, I wanted to make sure to extend a giant thank you to Aubrey Hicks, Ann Johnson, and Krista Paracas. They're all back there from the Bedrosian Center. <laughs> They're the ones who put in lots of time and hours to organize this to help me see ideas all the way through to something where you get to sit and listen to some amazing scholars. So our goal through the salon is to open a space to encourage the exchange of ideas with a crucial element being the scholars we bring to USC. So today's scholar helps us see that th through the melding of qualitative and quantitative sweat and evidence that place and institutional context matter for policy. Things that we listen to oftentimes and think about in our, um, in our classes, in our research, and in our communities. If you haven't bought her book, looks like this, you should. Even if it's just to meet individuals like Daphne, John, Kay, and Terry, as well as others. Her talent is evidenced throughout her work. A talent for truly listening with an open mind and a curious soul. Attributes that we greatly admire here. I will turn the formal introduction over to our indefatigable Dean, Dean Jack Knott. Well, thank you, Pam, and hello, everyone. And thank you for being with us here today. Uh, as was just mentioned, I'm Jack Nott, and I'm the dean of the Price School. You know, through the study of political institutions and policymaking and implement implementation, we as a school work toward a better understanding of public policy as well as politics, but with the ultimate goal, really, of making society a better place. The American democracy is a radical experience, uh, experiment. Uh, it had a very rocky and limited beginning. It almost collapsed in the 19th century. And it continues as a, what you might say is a messy work in progress uh, to this very day. These kinds of events and com conversations about our form of democracy and its impact on our society are vital and they really require a reckoning uh, with what our history has been about. So at the Price School, we strive to make uh, communities better. That's kind of our goal. And this work is closely entwined with public policy and politics. So I can't really think of a more fitting topic uh, to spend on this somewhat cloudy afternoon uh, here at USC than by talking about the role of fred federalism and fragmentation in our democratic polity. And so it's really with great pleasure that uh, we welcome Jamila Michener uh, here today to talk about her new book, Fragmented Democracy. She's an assistant professor at Cornell University in uh, beautiful upstate New York. She studies the way public policy shapes the lives of marginalized uh, communities in the U.S. She also co-leads the Finger Lakes chapter of Scholars Strategy Network, which works towards sharing academic research with practitioners, which is also very important as a professional school and public policy school. And Professor Michener also serves on the advisory board for the Cornell Prison Education Program, where she teaches in local correctional facilities. She's an exemplar of someone whose research is having an important impact on our academic fields of study, but who also is taking that research into action uh, to make our democracy and communities better. And that's something I deeply admire. So please join me in welcoming Jamila Michener. Thank you for those amazing, amazing introductions. Uh, I, besides all the stuff about me, uh, one thing that stood out to me was the insinuation that this is a cloudy day, <laughs> because I'm coming My from <laughs> I'm coming from upstate New York, and this is I've been telling everyone this is right around when we get out the slip and slide. <laughs> the summer is here. 
Um, so just enjoying uh, this beautiful campus and I appreciate you all being here today. It's sort of an interesting and, you know, tumultuous time, right? <laughs> and being in a room with more than five people feels like, you know, your life is at stake. So the fact that you all, I'm jokingly, <laughs> but it, if were that true, the fact that you were here, that you are here um, is, is even more special, right? Uh, so I, I'm excited to talk to you about my book today. One of the things I've realized is that, you know, before I wrote the book, I gave all of these talks. And then once the book was published, hardly anyone wanted me to give a talk on it anymore because we like to give feedback that can affect the product and change the, the outcome. And everyone realizes that once the book's published, the outcome is not going to change. And so uh, folks will invite me to give talks and say, on your new work that you're working on, which I, I, I also appreciate being able to present on. But I sort of have lamented that as soon as the book was published, very few people are at least academics. Um, academic institutions have invited me to present book talks. I have been um, heartened that uh, lots of advocacy organizations, hospitals, um, even, even um, HMOs, I mean, all sorts of healthcare related organizations have been interested. So I've been able to give a lot of those talks, but it's very different, it's very different. Uh, anyway, so there's the actual book cover. Um, and, and here's what I wanted to be on the cover. <laughs> Medicaid are millionaires, what will it be? And my editor said, you know, I think that that's very politicized, which is fine, but it might distract. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I, I guess I'll listen to advice. It's the first book. Um, second book, uh, no advice, right? Um, that's not true. So uh, I want to say that I didn't actually start off as a health policy researcher. I'm very much sort of committed to health policy now, and I love it. And so um, I'm, I think I'll always be doing health policy work to some extent. But I didn't start there. Um, I started with a kind of broader interest when I went to graduate school in understanding the factors that were affecting in particular low-income communities and communities of color, um, which were indeed the places that I grew up. I really started um, graduate school wanting to use political science as a tool to understand the things that I had experienced in my life growing up that were still very much unclear to me, that were still very much an enigma to me. And so I started, um, when I hit the point where I was looking for a dissertation topic, to really think about what that was going to look like. Um, and it was right around the time that the Affordable Care Act was passing. And I thought that the Affordable Care Act was interesting. Um, I followed sort of the, the political news around it. But if you had asked me uh, back in 2010, uh, we're approaching uh, a decade this month when the Affordable Care Act was still passed, if I thought that I was going to be this is what I was going to be spending a lot of my research career studying, I wouldn't have said yes, right? But it's been quite a roller coaster since then. And we have all, it feels like we've all been through a lot together, right? Anyone who cares about health policy or who even just follows it, um, who follows it in a cursory sort of way, uh, it does feel like there have been a lot of ups and downs. We've been on a roller coaster together. Um, and, and probably maybe at, at no other time like now, <laughs> Are, is it uh, prominent on everyone's mind, whether you cared about health policy before or not, uh, the stakes of thinking about who has access to resources around health and who doesn't. Uh, but although I followed this from afar, I didn't initially think that's what I was going to study. So how did I come to my research? I didn't come for, to it by just sort of magically thinking it up or even by reading lots of great research that existed at the time, but I just wasn't reading. Uh, I came to it by talking to people. So there was a, a sociologist on my dissertation committee. I was always interested in both quantitative and qualitative research. And so I understood that my, my project was likely going to be mixed methods. And the sociologist on my dissertation committee, his name was Mario Small. I went to, to talk to him, I remember, and I had all of these ideas that I, about the direction that I thought I could go in with my dissertation. Uh, and he said, this is a lot. This is maybe your whole, the whole rest of your career. <laughs> it's not your dissertation. But he said, you know, the thing that I understand about you is that you care a lot about particular kinds of communities. So instead of just in the vacuum of your mind coming up with a topic, why don't you go and talk to some of the people 
living in these communities and get a sense of what kinds, what, what are the ways that policy and government are affecting their lives um, and draw on the experiences of people in these communities as a starting point for thinking through your research project. And so that's what I did. And I started talking to people like Mabel, who is an African-American woman who lived on the south side of Chicago. She was one of the first people that I interviewed. Um, and I asked people very broad questions. So one of the questions that I asked Mabel was to tell me what she thought about the American dream. And this was her answer. She said, the American dream, and she sigh sighed really loudly. And I actually, I, I, this is an interview I'll never forget because Mabel had a, a distinctive personality, but she sighed a lot throughout <laughs> the interview. And I remember her sighing. And then when I got the interviews transcribed, and I went back and I read the transcript, the sighs weren't in there. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and I listened back through myself and I inserted the sighs because it said something important about, about how she was sort of working her way through the conversation with exasperation, right? Um, and she talks about the American nightmare. She talks about having to choose between food and medicine. She talks about at some point, um, you know, going to sign up for Medicaid but being discouraged. Uh, and then she talks about not really knowing whether voting makes a difference, right? And feeling like, well, it seems like it should make a difference, but it's not, not in the way, not in the sort of concrete material aspects of my life. So the first few interviews I had like this, probably the first half a dozen people that I talked to, everyone was bringing up healthcare. And part of the reason might have been because it was in the sort of political context at the time. But people weren't bringing it up in relation to the ACA and saying, I've been following the latest news on health policy, so I really have this on my mind. Uh, they were bringing it up in relation to their lives. And so it became really clear to me at this point that, that it mattered for people's lives. It also became clear to me, even early on before I was thinking about this in the context of policy feedback, I really was not, um, that it mattered for people politically. And so, that's what, what I started to think about, how Medicaid uh, matters politically. And interestingly, when I first started to sort of bat this around, and I would tell people, I want to think about the kind of political effects of Medicaid. And folks would say, well, why? Why would you, why would you assume that Medicaid has a political effect in people's lives? And, um, and it wasn't clear at the time whether we should expect Medicaid to work the way other policies work with respect to its, its, its political effects. So we knew, for example, at the time that programs like Social Security and GI benefits uh, had a kind of positive effect on people's political participation. And we also knew that a program like TANF had a negative effect on people's political participation. And there was this distinction between means-tested programs and non-means-tested programs. And, and it appeared that programs that were for the poor were stigmatizing and for a variety of reasons were sort of dampening political participation. And so I thought it wasn't clear really what boat Medicaid fell into. It was means-tested. But it was also really popular, right? And in terms of levels of support and popularity, Medicaid looks a lot more like Social Security than it does like welfare, right? Like temporary assistance for needy families, the program that we associate with cash assistance with welfare. Um, and also, at this point, and actually consistently since then, there was survey evidence suggesting that a lot of people thought about health care as something that was in the purview of the government to provide and as something that people should have access to. So it wasn't really clear to me um, what difference it would make in people's lives politically to receive Medicaid, to be a beneficiary of Medicaid, um, or whether it would make a difference. Maybe this was something that was orthogonal to people's understanding of politics. And so I, I set out to try to find this out. Um, in part, I was especially drawn to this subject matter because it lies at the intersection of, of three things that I, that I care a lot about and, and that flow through all of my research, which is race, poverty, and democracy. And it's worth pointing out that over at this point, over 90% of non-elderly Medicaid beneficiaries are, are living in poverty or near poverty. Um, and over 50% are black or Latino. So to the extent that we want to think about policy feedback in the context of inequality, how policies affect politics in the context of inequality, Medicaid is an important policy for thinking about that. It's also a massive policy. It's a program that over 70 million Americans rely on. 
Um, so I set out first to think about this, and I, I very much thought about it, about finding evidence, uh, quantitative evidence that could help me get some sense of whether I was at all barking up the right tree. Uh, it, one challenge was finding a survey that had enough people who were Medicaid beneficiaries that I could even look for a correlational um, relationship between Medicaid enrollment and political participation. Uh, a lot of the big surveys that political scientists use, uh, like the American National Elections Survey, uh, or even that you know sociologists and other social sciences so, social scientists use, like the General Social Survey. They, there are very few people in those surveys that, that use Medicaid, right? Um, and so once we got down to that number, I was going to be really limited in even being able to do a correlational analysis. So I found the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. Um, and this is a survey that's largely used by sociologists, although a handful of political scientists. Uh, and it actually follows a cohort of 5,000 children and their parents. And by, by definition, um, emphasizes families that are fragile in various ways, right? Um, and so uh, it's representative of non-marital births in large U.S. cities. I focus on wave three because that's where we have the questions on political participation. It would be great if there were questions on political participation across various waves because then we could leverage uh, the panel structure of the data. And right now I think they're on, you know, wave nine or ten or something like that. Um, but that's just not the case. The, the main benefit of this survey is that 53% of uh, the people in the survey utilized Medicaid, right? So I had a really large number of people to draw on. There are disadvantages too, happy to talk about that. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to get a sense of was just the basic relationship between being enrolled in Medicaid and some sort of political participation, political outcomes. So I looked at, this is just, this is just bivariate, right? I looked at voting, registering to vote, and then I created a, a, an index of a variety of, of political activities. So whether you had participated in a political group, um, whether you had participated in some sort of local political action, uh, et cetera. And so what I found was across each of these different political outcomes, uh, people who were enrolled in Medicaid were less likely to participate politically than people who weren't enrolled in Medicaid. Now, this isn't terribly surprising. People who are, who are enrolled in Medicaid are quite different than people who aren't enrolled in Medicaid, right? Uh, and they can be different in a number of ways. There, certainly you have to have a certain income level in order to be enrolled in Medicaid. So there are all sorts of things that come along with that. Um, and perhaps you're more likely to enroll in Medicaid if, you're, if you have health problems. Perhaps you're more likely to enroll in Medicaid if you have children who have health problems or if you have children at all. All sorts of reasons why we might think that this isn't actually a relationship, but there are all sorts of confounders here. And so part of what I set out to do was sort through as much of that as I possibly could. Now, what I couldn't do, although they did it in Oregon, um, but what I couldn't do was approach this experimentally and say, OK, great, let's give some people Medicaid and, and other people not Medicaid, and we'll do that randomly, and then we'll follow the results, right? Now, like I said, this, this was done in Medicaid. And very early on, when I first started this project, um, I, I emailed the folks in Oregon, and I said, I'm working on this project. Can I get the, the data from your experiment and link it with voting data? And, and they said no. <laughs> and they have since, many years later, like in the last year, actually, written that paper themselves. Um, and, it, and it actually supports <laughs> my findings. So anyway, um, it would have been wonderful if I could have done that experimentally. But we don't normally exper experimentally um, you know, dole out policy benefits. So at this point, I just wanted to do as much as I could given the limitations of the data, right? And so I did a few different things. One is just a standard regression beyond that sort of bivariate correlation. Let's account for, let's have a correlation that accounts for other things, right? And introduce a number of controls that might help me to get a sense of whether these kind of obvious confounders are, are actually doing the work and whether that initial relationship that I, that I observe remains once we control for more things. Then I expanded these models. I tried to think about, well, what's unique about this, this population, right? It may be drug and alcohol dependence, depression, incarceration, number of care, kids, marital status, the kinds of things we associate with economically marginal populations um, 
you know, and, and Medicaid beneficiaries fall into this category, right? Uh, then I did various, I matched based on various characteristics to try to see if I found people in the survey that looked similar in all of these different ways, except that the only thing they were different on was whether or not they were enrolled in Medicaid. And I compared them, would, would that difference in terms of political participation still hold? Um, and then I did seemingly unrelated regression. And, and, and the insight behind that, or the logic behind that, is that, well, maybe people who enroll in Medicaid are different in some way, right? So if you think about the, the, the matching strategy, find people who are similar in every way except Medicaid, match them on these various characteristics. Well, if those characteristics are similar, then what might explain why this set is enrolled in Medicaid and this set isn't? Maybe that, that selection in, is different in some way, and that affects my results. And so the SIR models helped me to try to account for, in some way, um, that level of selection, right? None of this is perfect, but what I found was that even when I did these various things, that core relationship stayed, right? And actually, um, most of these different kinds of, um, of analyses actually magnified the relationship, right? So it doesn't go away and it gets stronger. Now, of course, what I didn't understand at this point was why. What was going on here? And when I started to tell people what I was finding, they were like, well, it's still not plausible to me because I, what's happening? Why? You know? And the only way I could think to really get a sense of that was to collect more qualitative evidence. Well, this time I went back to um, the drawing board qualitatively, knowing what I was looking for. So those first few interviews that sort of sparked my interest in this project I was literally just having conversations with people about the different public policies that were affecting them in their lives and the way that they thought about the government. And it helped me to understand and focus the research. This time I go back and I know what I'm talking to people about. I'm talking to them about their experiences with Medicaid and I'm trying to get a sense of the kind of political ramifications of those experiences. Now, what I don't do is say, tell me, is being enrolled in Medicaid affecting your political behavior? <laughs> because, I mean, most people would not really respond very well to that question or know what to say, right? So instead, what I do is I have a conversation with people. I ask them to tell me about their experiences. And all sorts of things emerge from those conversations. So I interview 61 people for the book, 45 Medicaid. I'm actually doing some more research right now, and I've interviewed many, many more people. Um, including many more ben Medicaid beneficiaries, um, over 100. And it's actually been, that's not in the book, but it's been interesting to see how the, the results have been really consistent. Um, and some things are different based on changing political context, but the basic results here hold. But for the book, 45 Medicaid beneficiaries and 16, these people I call stakeholders. Stakeholders are... You know, and the reason I, the logic be, be behind interviewing stakeholders, these are people who are not Medicaid beneficiaries, but who are connected to Medicaid beneficiaries in various ways. Attorneys who represent, um, you know, them in public benefits cases. Uh, people who work at health advocacy organizations and advocate on behalf of Medicaid beneficiaries. Uh, health navigators who help people to enroll in Medicaid. And part of the logic there is people said, well, you know, if you talk to anyone about their insurance, they'll tell you how terrible it is and how hard it is. And if you talk to anybody about, you know, whether they have private insurance or Medicaid or what have you, or Medicare, fill in the blank. People just like to complain about their insurance, right? First of all, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Second of all, there's a difference between complaining and having really the kinds of really specific experiences that people tell me about here. But I also wanted to get a sense of a set of complementary perspectives from people who weren't so deep in the weeds of the experience that it felt like it was just sort of venting about every little thing that happened that you didn't like, although that's not what Medicaid beneficiaries were doing. But from people who could, who could observe what Medicaid beneficiaries were going through, but from a very different vantage point. That's who the stakeholders are. You know, what I'm aiming for with the interviews is range, and I'm in particularly interested in race, in categorical group, meaning, you know, whether your connection to Medicaid is through a, ch a child who's eligible, whether you're eligible as an adult, whether you're eligible because you have some sort of illness versus eligibility that's just on the basis of income. So there's a lot of variation in terms of categorical group, and I wanted to make sure I got that range. And then range in terms of geographic context. It turned out that geographic context was really important. And you know, you know that federalism is in the title of the book. But I didn't know that at the beginning. I didn't go in thinking that. 
actually, I remember in my American politics grad seminar, the two weeks that we did federalism, I remember looking at the syllabus and being like, oh, federalism. <laughs> this is so boring. Uh, and it actually wasn't boring. I enjoyed it in the, in the <coughs> seminar itself, but that was sort of my working model of fe federalism in my mind, right? So I didn't think that's what my book would be about. But I did know that there was quite a, a bit of geographic variation, and so I thought I wanted to make sure I get range there. Um, you know, one of the things to keep in mind, sometimes people say 61 interviews, like that's, th that's not real evidence, it's anecdotal or it's fill in the blank, whatever else we might say. Um, you know, there's a different purpose that the qualitative evidence plays, right? And it's not representativeness. I wouldn't claim that these people are representative of any sample, right? Those are statistical concepts that would apply for the survey, but don't apply here, right? Range is important, because I want to get a range of experiences. But really, qualitative evidence helps us to get a certain degree of depth, right? Not necessarily an ideal amount of breadth, but depth that gives us a sense of the processes at play, right? One of the ways that I like to think about it is that, you know, we have a sense of the things uh, that we know, right? The things that we know, um, a sense of the things that we know we don't know. We're aware of the fact that we don't know these things, so we can maybe uh, create hypotheses about them and explore answers around discovering the things that we know we don't know. But then there's this whole realm of things that we don't know we don't know. We just don't even know. We don't have the first place to begin. And qualitative evidence is great at helping us unmask those kinds of processes. So that's the goal here, right? Um, and it, along the way, I'm able to generate hypotheses. I'm able to think about the patterns that I observed in the quantitative evidence differently. And so the qualitative evidence serves its purpose. So at first, what emerges is a broad story that I found to be pretty consistent with what scholars who study the relationship between policy and political participation already found. Um, people talked about things like stigma and the various ways that they were stigmatized as they were um, taking advantage of, or not taking advantage of, but utilizing the benefits that Medicaid had to offer. And there were various levels of intensity to the way that people felt stigma. Some people just kind of felt embarrassed, right? Um, some people felt like they were treated like stupid animals, right? That's, that's a different level of intensity. But this was a very consistent, um, a very consistent uh, perspective that people across the different categorical groups, across the different places that I interviewed, um, expressed, right? And then people also talked about negative bureaucratic interactions of various kinds, whether it was because they got their binder to apply and it was like, oh my gosh, this is completely overwhelming, um, or because they just experienced people being inefficient, incompetent, rude to them in the process of actually going and getting or utilizing Medicaid benefits, right? So I thought, oh, okay. This is a consistent story and it helps make sense maybe of the negative relationship between Medicaid enrollment and political participation, right? One thing that people started saying to me when I, you know, when I was first talking about this project is, oh no, this means Medicaid is bad for democracy. You know, Paul Ryan is going to love it. That's back when Paul, isn't that right? It totally dates the project when, when Paul Ryan was like a thing. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> people said, you know, it's going to suggest that Medicaid is bad for democracy. And, and is that really what you want to do? And is that the road you really want to go down? Um, and no, <laughs> that's, and it's not really what the evidence suggests, right? Because along the way, I also encountered these unexpected narratives that I wasn't looking for and I wasn't thinking about, but I found it's the beauty of qualitative research. You can find things that you weren't looking for. Um, I opened the book with Terry, and Terry was a, uh, a black woman that I interviewed in Georgia. And I had met her the day before at a Medicaid office, and I asked her if she'd be willing to sit down and talk to me about her experiences, and she agreed. So the next day we sit down, and I didn't tell her any, I just said, I'm studying Medicaid. Would you be willing to sit down and tell me about your experiences with Medicaid? Nothing else. And when we sit down, the first thing she says is this. She tells me about her son, and then she tells me about all of the differences in Medicaid state to state and how hard it has been keeping up with that and what a whirlwind it's been keeping her son safe and healthy. And she's able to detail exactly what she means here. Ohio's the easiest, they really care about their people. I was like, really? But you know, 
different times, different places, right? Um, California, the process is faster, but there are so many people. It's so rapid. It's out of control. Um, I have since experienced that trying to FOIA California for data. <laughs> it's like really hard to get what you actually ask for, um, at least around Medicaid. Uh, in Georgia, there are limitations in everything they offer. You can only go to this doctor on that day at this time. And I was surprised at the detail that Terry could give me about her experiences in each of these places. She then tells me about her grandmother, and she's getting teary-eyed at this point and says, you know, when I knew I was going to meet you, I got upset thinking about it. And she talks about her grandmother visiting her in Georgia from Chicago um, and getting sick while she was there and needing to have her prescriptions filled but not being able to do that, right? And, and she says that they had to find $190 to fill her grandmother's prescription, and, and, and Terry and her family are very poor. She says that was amazing. For something that's provided by the government, you're limiting the use of something meant to make people better. It became very clear to me in this conversation that this was political for Terry. So what I didn't say to people like, I didn't say like, oh, that, so th you really thought about that politically, didn't you? <laughs> you know, often, you know, when I ask people, I would ask people in the interview, what do you think of when I see the, say the word politics? And literally, most of the time, I got blank stares, you know? So it's not as though in their minds people are saying, this is political. But as they're talking to me about it, it becomes clear. So Terry would say things like this. If it was about helping people, you would say, yes, let my state be more productive and healthy so that we don't have people losing their lives, so they can be productive citizens, right? And at one point, I asked Terry if she thought that there was anything people like her could do to change this circumstance, to make a program like Medicaid more responsive to the needs of people like her. And, and she looked at me and she said, white noise. And I didn't know what that meant, but you know, in interviews, silence is productive. So I just sort of let a few moments go by. She didn't clarify. So I said, what do you mean? She said, white noise is the people that used to say, well, if they give it to me, they give it to me. If they don't, they don't. White noise means you feel like in your world, you have no say, no say in the process if you don't agree with what's going on with Medicaid. It's demeaning, you know, the process. I've never, really see, I've never seen anyone really stand up about Medicaid. I don't know why we don't fight. Um, and this conversation with Terry was the first that's where I thought, man, maybe there's something about geographic variation that's more than just something I should control for. <laughs> you know, maybe it is actually part of the story. And then I had conversation after conversation after conversation like that. Now, I can't put all of them on the slide because we'll be here all day. But that's what the book is for. A lot of those conversations emerge in the book. Someone else that I talked to, very different from Terry. John is, you know, Terry is sort of traditionally poor. She grew up living in poverty. She's an African-American woman. Um, John actually grew up middle class. Uh, he's a middle-aged white man, but he has a chronic illness. And at some point, as a child, he was enrolled in Medicaid because the cost of, of caring for him, the health care costs were beyond what was possible for him. So I'm talking to John, very different person. He lives in a different state. He lives in Michigan, not Georgia, um, about his experiences with Medicaid. And he, I realized throughout the interview, we keep talking about John's life, like about how dissatisfied he feels about where he is in his life. And I'm thinking like, this isn't a therapy session. Like, we're here to talk about Medicaid. And it took me a, a few minutes. It, I was like, we, we were into the interview before I realized that those things are actually pretty deeply intertwined for John. And he said, I'm not where I want to be, but beggars can't be choosers. I try to tell myself, I'll live on Mars if I have to, right? You got to do what you got to do. It's just, it's not very fun, but unless something changes, you know, where I can get, where if they did like federal insurance and everybody had insurance regardless of who we are, where we are, I think it would solve a lot of problems for people, but I don't think that's going to happen. Now, the backstory here is that John was living in Michigan, but many of his friends and family had moved to Arizona. And he wanted to go to Arizona too. He had a, a, a chronic illness, but he thought that the sort of drier climate in, in Arizona would actually be good for his lungs. And his family was moving there and he was ready for a change. But when he checked to see if the benefits that he got in Michigan would be available in Arizona, he found out that a lot of them would not. And some of the benefits that wouldn't be available were crucial to his, his literally his survival, right? Um, 
He po- he's the one who pointed out to me in this interview that the name of Arizona's Medicaid program is the Arizona Health Care Cost Containment Program. That's, that's what Medicaid is called in Arizona, right? Um, and that's how it's experienced for people like John. So he realized there's no way he could move there. He'd be putting his life at stake. And he described himself as being married to Michigan medically and very much felt stuck in his life because of Medicaid. And that's why we kept talking about his life. And I was like, wait, this is about Medicaid, not your life. But actually, those things were deeply intertwined. But he also goes in and out of talking about policy. And it it comes out at various points in the book. Eventually, he talks about politics and he talks about how he engages in politics, about going to the Capitol in Lansing and trying to get uh, benefits for people who have his particular illness, about fighting Medicaid when they decided that they didn't want to give him a particular feeding tube that he needed in order to live, Uh, getting an infection and almost dying because he couldn't get the feeding tube changed, right? And he thinks about all this through the prism of like, of states, of Michigan, of, and of Medicaid, and how different is, it is in different places and what the implications are for him. And so I started to think, okay, wait, the geographic variation piece is not just about controlling for you know, what state someone lives in. This is part of the story. It's a major part of what's shaping people's experience and their access. So I go back to, to the Fragile Families data, which I had never before looked at in this way, and I identified 15 states in that data where I had enough Medicaid beneficiaries that I could actually look at subgroups of beneficiaries in particular states. And I wanted to see if the negative relationship that I initially found between Medicaid and political participation varied across states. And it did. And I found that in a handful of the states where I had enough data to be able to look at this relationship by state, New York, California, Virginia, there was a negative relationship. In many of these states, it appeared that there wasn't much of a relationship at all. That's anywhere that the the bar crosses the red line. And in Wisconsin, but remember, this is Wisconsin circa 2004, which is where the data is from, there's a positive relationship. And Wisconsin, in many ways, makes sense because Wisconsin was one of the first states that said, we're going to give Medicaid to everyone at 100% of the poverty line um, or below. And that wasn't happening when Wisconsin initially did that. It was happening hardly anywhere, right? And actually, the first states that did that sort of thing were Wisconsin, Tennessee, not, not what we would have thought of as the usual suspects. Um, and so now I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Different, different relationship in different places, but why, right? Uh, so I started to think about the state policy context. And what specific aspects of state policy context would help us to understand those relationships? And this is where I went back to my interviews to see, well, what aspects of state policy context were people talking to me about, right? Because in fact, I found that people were very much aware of policy. They didn't say to me, here are the aspects of state policy context that are shaping the relationship between my political participation and Medicaid, right? Of course not. But it came out in my conversations with them. So people often mention expansions and retractions. People know when they're given something they didn't have before, and they most certainly know when something is taken away from them that they did have before, right? Prospect theory. Um, The policy is changing, making it hard for anyone pretty much to go to a doctor just to get a general PAP or any kind of exam, right? So people know when something changes and before they could get an exam easily, and now it's hard. Another thing people often mention was the scope of services. I was astonished, and and, uh, I shouldn't have been. Um, Part of it is just like, why do we have such low expectations of people, or why do I, perhaps? But of the detail um, with which people could recount the nature of their benefits. You know what? I can get vision for free. I can get podiatry for free, but I can't get dental. And so this is how I organize my life in order to account for that. I go to the free dental clinic up the street that's for low-income families, but when I go you know, to get my glasses, I go to the nice place because Medicaid, will cut. and people could lay it all out for me. So they understood the scope of services really well, what was covered, what wasn't covered, right? And the third thing was administrative capacity, and this goes back to the negative bureaucratic interactions. People often said, you know, there's just not, there just aren't enough people staffing these offices, right? Not everyone said this, but, but many people did. And so I thought, well, perhaps part of people's experience is being shaped by the administrative capacity of these organizations. So all of these things vary across states. And I looked at at, at 
at the, the kind of variation along these metrics um, and what it meant for the relationship between Medicaid and um, political participation. I won't show you all of this because we'll be here forever. This is just one example. So if you look at uh, an index that I created of Medicaid policy reduction, which tells us, for example, whether in the year prior to the survey, a state had reduced some um, element of, of Medicaid, whether you know, services that, that people were eligible for, um, the income level that people were eligible at, et cetera. What we find is that in states where uh, there was some sort of reduction in the previous year, um, the likelihood of participating across these different political outcomes is also on the decline, right? And, and I can look at that for, and, and in the book I do, for each of these different elements of state policy context, right? Before I round out, I want to say that in the book, I think about, I describe this as sort of federalism all the way down. So beyond states, I actually think about other sort of entities, other geographic entities. And the reason why is just because people bring up other geographic entities. They talk about states and what state they live in and the kind of implications of that for the benefits they get and their experiences with Medicaid. Um, but they also talk about, talked about counties and they talked about neighborhoods. And at first, I wasn't sure what to do with this because I was like, oh, wait, I know how to conceptualize what's going on here with states. But like counties, neighborhoods, all this stuff kind of nested in, they're nested in one another. How do I think about this? And so in different chapters, I approach this in different ways. Many counties, for example, are, are responsible for the sort of administrative piece of Medicaid. Um, and in particular, if something goes wrong, if there's a benefit that you're supposed to get that you don't get, um, if you have a negative experience at the local office, this, this sort of thing is going to be adjudicated at the county level, right? So I think about how county bureaucratic structures affect appeal processes in the book, in the book right? And I ask people both in the interviews about their experience of appeal processes and I look at administrative data from, that I FOIA'd from states to see how county level variation affects administrative state Medicaid administrative processes, right? Similarly, with neighborhoods, people brought up their neighborhoods again and again and again. I opened the book with Daphne, who is almost exclusively talking about neighborhood, about Medicaid in relationship to her, na her neighborhood context. And I remember after I interviewed um, Daphne, I went home that day and I thought, well, neighborhoods definitely have something to do with this, but I just hadn't thought about that before. And I remember when I first started to try to articulate this to people, they would say, neighborhoods, Medicaid, Medicaid's a state and federal policy, like neighborhoods don't, what, what does this have to do with it? Um, and instead of assuming that someone like Daphne was just wrong, I actually tried to think through uh, the process. And I tried to think through the Medicaid to politics link and what neighborhoods might have to do with it, right? Um, and so I took, uh, insights like this from someone like Daphne, and then I went to a different set of data, right? So for this, I used the project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods data, where I have really fine-grained data um, about, um, you know, variation in terms of, uh, you know, Medicaid across neighborhoods. And I, and I also have data on people's perceptions of their neighborhoods and their understanding of their neighborhoods. And I get to look at the sort of neighborhood context and, medic and um, in relation to the Medicaid to politics link, right? And what I'm able to find is that in neighborhoods that people perceive um, as disorderly and in neighborhoods that are suffering from more structural disadvantage, the relationship, there's a negative relationship between Medicaid and political participation, but in other kinds of neighborhoods, there's not. And, and that's over and above controlling for the things that we might think make those neighborhoods different from one another. And one of the things that I find in particular by talking to people and then also looking at the quantitative data in relationship to that, is that people don't think about, negative, about Medicaid in the same bounds that we do, right? Like, well, Medicaid is a federal state program and so th that must be where the effects lie, right? Instead, people are going to the clinic up the street and they're calling it the Medicaid clinic, even though it's not the Medicaid clinic, it's a clinic. A lot of people who go to the clinic might have Medicaid. That clinic might rely on Medicaid funding, but it's not as though Medicaid built that clinic. But it's called the Medicaid clinic in the neighborhood. And if when you're going there, you're passing by people who are shooting up and you get there and the paint is peeling off the walls and the air condition isn't working and it's hot and you sit there and you wait for two hours only to see a doctor for 10 minutes who doesn't seem to care about you, guess what? 
The way that you think about Medicaid, the way that you understand your relationship to the government that is providing that service, that starts to change, right? So that structural inequality in a neighborhood is affecting the way that people interpret their experiences with Medicaid and shaping the Medicaid to politics link, right? And then towards the end of the book, I think about key actors, and this is where I really focus on policy advocates and activists and the role they play in this process. I won't go too much into this for the sake of time, but I will say that the great thing about talking to policy advocates and activists were that they actually explicitly articulated the implications of federalism. I didn't have to sort of dig this out of them. I just asked them about what I did, what they did, and then they told me. They told me about how they strategized explicitly in order to get over the challenges that federalism presented, but then how they also strategized explicitly in order to leverage the opportunities that federalism presented. So even on the sort of meso level of policy advocates and activists, um, federalism is playing a role. And, and fragmentation across states and localities uh, can, can be sort of negative in this way. It can weaken advocacy. It can make it difficult for um, advocates and activists to hold policymakers accountable and for them themselves to work together. But it can also be helpful and be enabling. It could give activists ideas about how to do things when they see those things done in other places. And it it lends itself to them actively working together and sharing insights and processes and methods with each other about how to create change. So I want to end here just with some key takeaways. Medicaid has different political effects across states, counties, and even neighborhoods. In the book, I call this contextualized feedback. Yes, there's a relationship between politics and policy, but it's contextualized because that relationship is unfolding within a broader context that is structured by our larger political system, by federalism. And so that matters, and it means we can't just say the policy feedback effect of Medicaid is negative, right? Actually, it depends, which is actually, a, a, many people think that, that, this, that that's the takeaway of the book, and I'm always like, did you read it? Um, it's, it's not just, it's not negative or positive, it's context dependent, which means we have to think about it in a much more nuanced way. It also means that this overarching argument that, well, Medicaid's bad for democracy, is not true, right? Because it depends on how it's implemented, and it depends on the policy structures that affect people's relationships with Medicaid. And so what that means is that there's leverage for structuring the relation, people's relationships with Medicaid via policy in ways that are actually a boon to democracy. Medicaid doesn't have to be bad for democracy. It's not as though, well, you're giving people health care and it's making them apathetic naturally. No, it's that you're structuring this program in particular ways that can either alienate people from the government and from their role as political actors or not or incorporate them, that there are options, which means there are different ways that we can do this better rather than worse. Um, and, you know, and I, as I just emphasized, federalism is a problem. Part of what people would say to me is like, well, you know, you're going to say federalism is bad, and that's not that exciting because guess what? We got to live with it, right? Um, but that's not what I'm saying, right? It's actually the vehicle through which this kind of politics operates. And by understanding that better, we can think about what it might look like to intervene or what it might take, for example, if you wanted to mobilize Medicaid beneficiaries. But by identifying that larger institutional context as federalism as an important piece of this puzzle, we know more which can actually enable us to change things. It doesn't sort of tie our hands like, oh no, well now this is all about an institution that you know, is difficult to change, so I guess we can't do anything. It's actually quite the opposite. And so I argue that political scientists, policymakers, policy activists, and other political actors should actually be actively thinking about the democratic consequences of federalism, both with respect to Medicaid and health policy, and more broadly beyond that. Happy to talk about future directions with some of my research if anyone's interested. Of course, Medicaid is ever changing and there are a ton of things going on now with work requirements and Section 1115 waivers. So there's like no bottom to where research on Medicaid can go, which is good and bad, right? People are like, oh, Medicaid, you have a lot of work to do. I'm like, yeah, I wish I had less. Um, I have a project now where I'm thinking a lot about a different program, WIC, and looking at it comparatively in relation to Medicaid. A lot of overlap between these two programs. Most people who receive WIC also receive Medicaid, but they have completely different experiences with WIC. 
and it's because of the design of the program. And so leveraging a program that's actually um, affecting people in a very different way to gain insights about how we might improve uh, the administration and the design of Medicaid. Um, and then I'm working on a project right now that's looking at, uh, at civil legal structures. And so I'm in part focusing on um, medical legal partnerships. And this is when Medicaid beneficiaries are not just dealing with Medicaid and they're not just dealing with doctors and, and other healthcare practitioners, but they're actually given lawyers who help them sort through a whole range of issues in their lives that are often either hindering their ability to use uh, their Medicaid benefits efficiently um, or uh, just hindering, uh, causing all kinds of other kind of social determinants of health that mean that even the benefits that Medicaid is bringing aren't necessarily helping them as much as they should. And so the questions I'm, I'm pursuing there are around when we bring in a different kind of institution um, that's also embedded in the same larger context as Medicaid, but doing very different things, um, civil legal institutions, and those inter institutions interact, what can we see happen in people's lives? And it turns out that, that, that it's cool. That's, I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Um, okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Abby Wood. Hi. I am so excited about this. Um, it, it was kind of a, like a story about negative effects on political participation. And I'm wondering, over the time period you studied, was there ever a state that went the other direction and it made things better? Was it only Wisconsin? What did they do right? Like, what can you tell us about the way that people implementing policy can do so in a way that does bring people in and engages people in politics more broadly? I think that's great. Um, so I would say over the time period that I study in the book, there's actually, there are actually very few examples I can find that are positive. Uh, there's a little bit of a blip of, of you know, light in, um, in Iowa at this time. And part of what's happening in Iowa is that there's actually a pretty significant uh, mobilization of different health care advocacy organizations and just organizations of all sorts that start working together because not because the state is doing anything right per se, but because the state is proposing um, to make massive changes to Medicaid, changes that people are really afraid of. Um, and so political mobilization begins. And it's really interesting to see uh, the way that it unfolds in Iowa. There are a couple things that are really different about Iowa. It's super homogenous racially. Um, but the mobilization that emerges is actually uh, quite heter heterogeneous in terms of class, such that we haven't, this comes out a little in the book, and since then I've actually dug a lot more into it. Um, you know, you have people who are middle class and just have sick children, and, and they're only connected to Medicaid through their children, uh, working together with people who are traditional poor. And these are folks who don't live in the same neighborhoods, who don't interact with each other in any of the same sp social spaces. Um, and Medicaid and the, the threats to Medicaid start to bring them together. Um, and in working together, they're able to do some things, right? There are some things that the state government at different points says they're gonna do, merge different funding streams, merge different programs that were separate before that they're able to halt. Um, but kind of the biggest changes uh, happen anyway. And so there's mixed results there, but there's very much a sense that they're able to change the course of things for the better. And that kind of, that, that same mobilization continues to this day. So, and most of that I get from the qualitative data. Uh, and at the time that I'm writing the book, I just, I don't find a lot of qualitative examples of those sorts of things happening. Now, since then, there have been quite a few, right? Um, there have been a number of states that have either pushed and gotten their legislatures to expand Medicaid uh, or um, states where Medicaid has been put on, Medicaid expansion has been put on the ballot. And in almost every state where Medicaid expansion has been put on the ballot, um, people, advocates in those states have reached out to me. And I've talked to them about their, they've, their, their strategies. They have active strategies around thinking about how to engage Medicaid beneficiaries. And they actually explicitly strategize around the reality that particular subsets of Medicaid beneficiaries um, are going to be very difficult to mobilize because of the kinds of things that I talk about in the book. 
and they think actively about how to organize in response to that, right? So Kansas is a great example. Utah is another one um, where they worked a lot with, um, with organizations uh, in, le so local health clinics, Medicaid clinics, right? Medicaid, cl Medicaid clinics, so to speak, uh, to try to reach people who they thought would otherwise not participate and bring them in. And they mobilized and organized them around their negative experiences with Medicaid. They said, we know that you're having these terrible experiences with Medicaid. If we want Medicaid to be better, we need power, and here's how we're going to do it. And, and they brought in different actors in order to try to kind of gain legitimacy around that narrative. And anyway, so there are a lot of cool things that happened after the book was passed. Um, our, the book was published, which was not a long time ago, but it's been a... It's been a long couple years. <laughs> couple years, you know? Um, and the thing that I've most enjoyed has been engaging with those non-academic folks who are like out there in the trenches doing this work, who every time say, this is exactly what's happening. Like, this is exactly what's going on. But there aren't a lot of positive examples outside of, as far as I can tell from the evidence I have, outside of the last few years and the push around Medicaid expansion. Um, because what I found is that the key to sort of, and this doesn't come up as much in the book, but it's become really clear to me now, is that one key to sort of turning some of this around in the states that are more recal recalcitrant, which many of the states where Medicaid expansion was slow coming are in that category, um, is the involvement of organizations, of activists and advocates, right? And Medicaid expansion has really catalyzed those folks to get involved in a way that they hadn't before. And it has created a demand and a need for them to mobilize and organize more broadly. So not just among like policy elites who are gonna kind of strategically try to work you know, um, their connections, but they realize like we're not gonna get Medicaid expansion unless there are a lot of people making noise. So they've been actively thinking about how to do that and now are kind of in this Medicaid organizing space in a way that, that they, they weren't before. Um, and it's creating a lot of new and exciting positive examples that I, at least I didn't know about before. I'm really interested in the, your point about how organizations seem really important. And I'm curious to know if um, the organizations that are involved, it, like, is your take that they're do they tend to be organizations that are mainly like based in uh, maybe in DC or in New York, headquartered at the national level, or is it mainly organizations that are focused at the state and local level? And then just like also, is there much of a connection between yeah. national and state? It's kind of a federalism organizations. What are you seeing, or do you have a take on that? Yeah, this is great. I, I have to say, this is not something that I would have had a great take on like immediately after writing the book, because in part, I, you know, the organizations are the, the advocacy organizations I interviewed for the book. I, I interviewed those people when I was just getting a sense of the advocacy landscape. So I started with the kind of prime movers as far as national organizations. So an organization like Community Catalyst, that actually what they do is they, they work with lots of different grassroots healthcare organizations and fund them and connect them and provide them with support, technical support, resources, knowledge. And so, at the point that I was writing the book, I was thinking about, I, or I was mostly in contact with and engaging those sorts of, what I would call like um, meso level organization, or, or connector organization. So Community Catalyst is at the national level, but it's doing a lot of connecting at the state level. Um, since then, I've been sort of, um, you know, connected into a much larger network of organizations. And I will say, uh, everyone tells me the same thing, which is there are many more grassroots organizations involved in Medica Medicaid advocacy now than there were certainly prior to the ACA um, and certainly prior to kind of Medicaid expansion being something that needed to be kind of fought for tooth and nail. So a lot of the organizations that I was referencing in, in that last answer I gave were, are, are I'm thinking about like, local organizations and state organizations, and they're absolutely connected to each other, although I will say their relationships can sometimes be quite tense. Um, many of the grassroots local organizations actually think about healthcare as one. This, of, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I will. It varies quite a bit across place, right? 
Um, but I, I think that this is, in, in, my, in the sort of grand scheme of things, I think that this is true in many places. The grassroots organizations think about healthcare as one important plank, um, and they're often doing more than one thing. Um, so they also want to be advocating around racial justice, and they also want to be advocating around issues of economic justice. And, and healthcare is a piece of those things, right? You don't get racial and economic justice without, without healthcare, without access to Medicaid. And so they have that view. And the organizations on the state level actually tend to be a little bit, uh, a bit more focused, not a little bit, but substantially more focused. Like we are a health advocacy organization. And we want to be able to tap into our connections in the state legislature, which means we can't be going on and on about racial justice all the time. We actually have to just be focused on Medicaid expansion. And who are the three people, you know, Missouri is a perfect example of this. Like, who are the four people in the state legislature who we know we may be able to turn? And if we do, we may be able to get Medicaid expansion. And if we start talking about racial justice, that's not happening, right? And so there are these tensions that emerge between the state level organizations that are thinking much more about playing the kind of a uh, game of politics as the, at the elite state level and the grassroots organizations that, that are doing the actual organizing on the ground. And the state level organizations want the organizing on the ground to happen because that's also giving them leverage at the kind of elite political level, but they don't want it to happen in ways that are going to erode their leverage, right? And sometimes they want it to happen in different ways than the grassroots organizations can abide in part because of, again, geography. So a lot of the, the kind of strongest grassroots organizations are in the urban parts of states. But in the legislatures, the recalcitrant legislators often represent rural constituencies. So the state level organizations are telling the grassroots organizations, you need to start doing work in the rural parts of the state. We need people there going to their elected officials offices. We need people there saying that they want Medicaid. That's going to give us leverage in the, in the, in the, you know, at the Capitol. So there are all of these interesting intergovernmental dynamics going on, um, on the state and local level between organizations. It's like a whole nother paper, not book. I can't, do a book, but there's definitely a paper there. And I've sort of been collecting uh, this qualitative data as I've gone along, just because of all the opportunities I've gotten to work with these organizations. Um, and I, it's, it's almost so much, it's hard for me to know exactly what to do with it, you know? But it's a great question, because the federalism, it, it, if, it, it's, it's sort of bleeding through the organizations as well. It's not just the individual political behavior where we see that. I have a couple of questions, but I'm gonna let me ask this one. Uh, did you find any patterns in the fragile families data or the interview data that were you saw differences by race? Um, and I'm particularly interested in the Latino population because I can imagine lots of interesting interactions between citizenship and multi generations and mixed status and so forth. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it was uh, this definitely comes out in the fragile family or in the interview data. Uh, it's a little bit trickier in the fragile families data, um, particularly with the Latino population. Um, there are, for example, you know, with that population, there's lots of challenges around missing data in ways that are not random, right? And that would make it difficult for, for, for precisely the reasons that you just mentioned. You know, in the waves of fragile families now, they've actually done new and cool things to try to uh, bring those families and keep them in the data um, and to uh, deal with some of those missingness issues. Uh, but in the wave that I, where the, I have the questions that, that I'm using here, um, there's a lot of like odd missing data problems that made it, that, that, that hindered my confidence in, in those findings. But I still find differences across race. Um, I don't bring those up from in the quantitative in the book very much for this precise reason, because if I'm not, if I'm not confident in the data, I'm not going to make claims and say there's a thing here, you know. Um, but certainly in the qualitative data, it's there, um, and it's there quite a bit. And I'll say two things in particular. So first of all, in, in the actual qualitative instrument, which is in the back of the book, I don't, I very self-consciously don't bring up race. Um, now, you know, it's funny. For many people, I bring up race just by being the person asking you the question, right? So I explain in the appendix that, you know, I'll, 
especially for white beneficiaries who it was actually very hard for me to get them to interview with me and talk to me. Um, I'll, I do have research assistants who interview them because uh, who I train who are like white students because I want to make sure that there aren't things that, that, are, that are just not coming up because I'm the one who, who's asking them. Similarly, uh, for some of the Latino beneficiaries that I interview, I have a student who I train who's fluent in Spanish, who does, if, if, if there was somebody who wanted to interview in Spanish, she did those interviews, right? Um, for the interviews with the white beneficiaries, nothing really seemed different. When we look at the transcripts, uh, the differences between the white beneficiaries I interviewed and my white RAs interview, there's just, there's just nothing really that's different. They're not bringing up race either way because it's just, it doesn't matter who's interviewing them. It's not on the radar. Um, Latino beneficiaries and black beneficiaries are bringing up race no matter who's interviewing them. In particular, black people are bringing up race and they're bringing up the most and they're viewing their experiences with Medicaid through the prism of race, almost every single piece of it at every level. Um, and that's whether I'm the one interviewing them or someone else who's not black <coughs> is interviewing them, but especially when I'm interviewing them. Latino beneficiaries are a little bit different. They do bring up race more when my RA who is Latino is interviewing them. Uh, and they bring it up in, in quite different contexts. So, uh, demographically, more of the Latino beneficiaries that I interviewed were not Medicaid beneficiaries themselves, but had children who were Medicaid beneficiaries and couldn't qualify for various reasons for themselves, often related to documentation. And so they have this take on Medicaid that is mitigated through their children. So they talk about things like children being treated better on Medicaid than adults. Um, they talk about things like, um, you know, and often it's interesting, Black beneficiaries are saying that Latino people are, are treated better who have Medicaid. Latino beneficiaries are saying that black people are treated better because they're native to this country. And so there's all sorts of intra-racial politics there. So there's a lot, there's a whole lot with race. And I thought for a long time about writing a chapter about race. Um, and I just ended up not doing it uh, because there were a lot of different observations along the way, but it, there wasn't sort of one clear thematic like this is what race is doing that seemed to like cut across all the interviews. So it was clear that race was important, um, but in like manifold and sometimes discrete ways, both across groups and across different aspects of the program. Have you been able to do any longitudinal follow up to, to see if there's trends in political participation uh, or is anything shifting currently in relation to discussions around Medicare for all? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm still doing uh, research around this. I wouldn't say that it's longitudinal in the sense that it's like not a direct, you know. Um, I have tried to get fragile families to put another. I'm like, put more political participation questions. Uh, but, you know, it's, they're largely sociologists and I don't know what happened in wave three, but somebody got them to do it. And I have not been successful in getting it. That would be really great. Uh, because it would be the same data, uh, but or at least the you know the same se se data series. Um, mostly, what I've been thinking about is not necessarily longitudinal, but trying to understand the way the changes in the context of Medicaid in the last few years, what those mean, right? Um, and in particular, uh, these restrictive waivers that are either trying to implement work requirements, trying <laughs> largely unsuccessfully because the courts keep getting in the way, but also doing other things like, you know, making the, you know, retroactive eligibility window smaller, increasing premiums and co-pay. So cost sharing issues are initiatives. There are all sorts of ways that those waivers are, are actually systematically making life more difficult for Medicaid beneficiaries in many ways. And so I've been working with a team of a bunch of scholars all over the country who are trying to collect systematic data on this in different states. And one of the things we've been doing is working to, so it's not like there's one big survey that's gonna be in every single state because that would just be really hard. It's difficult to survey Medicaid beneficiaries. It's super expensive. But what we find is that a, a lot of, there are, there are contingents of scholars and, and government, state governments, in many different states that are going to collect various kinds of data about this. And so we're trying to work together in collaboration to ensure that as that data is collected, it's data that can be useful to social scientists, 
both with respect to like health outcomes and how these kinds of policy changes are affecting health outcomes and with respect to political participation. And so I've been that annoying person on the call that's like, could you put just one battery of questions on the survey <laughs> asking people about, um, and actually I think it's gotten easier over the last, like the, this, this collaborative working group I'm part of over the last year and a half um, in part because like it's very difficult for people to ignore that politics matters here. And there are folks who say like, I'm like a, a traditional health services research person. Like I don't do politics. I think of my work as very separate from that. And even I have to acknowledge that we probably have to pay attention to this, you know? So it's getting easier and easier. Um, and so there's data being collected which means that I think in a few years, it's really hard because so many of these policies are not even, nothing's decided yet, right? What is it, three weeks ago, we're still getting court decisions about work requirements and everything is ever shifting. So the goal is really collect as much data as we can along the way so that at some point, hopefully when things stabilize, we have the tools to be able to say, okay, now let's look at what all this has done along the way. And in particular, one question I'm interested in is the, the implications of the instability for people's politics, right? What does it mean when in a place like Kentucky where there were work requirements and then they weren't because they were halted by the court and then you got a new governor and there were work requirements again and then you got a new governor and there weren't work requirements again. No, but Medicaid beneficiaries in Kentucky, I've been working with some grassroots organizations there, are completely confused. There are tons of people who are telling local organizations, well, I can't apply for Medicaid because there's a work requirement. And they're like, no, 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 no. We have a new governor. There's not a work requirement anymore. So it's yo-yoing. People are all over the place. And so the instability itself is really interesting as far as examining political effects. But it's just going to be a few years before there's anything really to say besides like my speculation, which might be interesting, but isn't rooted in enough just yet. I just wanted to ask about, you just touched very briefly on, at the very beginning, the stakeholders. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that stakeholders um, would have political sway a little bit with, um, I, know, I know the American Medical Association, the American Dental Association, those are big organizations, and they have a lot to say about Medicare and that process politically. And did you get any sense of politics at play with the stakeholders that you interviewed or yeah. what kind of messaging they had with their clients um, yeah, or so that process at all? No, this is, this is interesting. So, you know, as far as organizations like the AMA and uh, those are not the kinds of stakeholders that I that I interviewed. So the kinds of stakeholders I interviewed were the the folks who were like really close to Medicaid beneficiaries, like healthcare navigators or what have you. Um, and interestingly, what I found so it actually depended on who the stakeholder was. So the healthcare navigators, I talked to a few navigators. They were very um, aware of not coming across to me as political, and like would emphasize like. Our job actually is just to lead people to these resources. Like, we don't have, you know, we're, we're like supposed to be bipartisan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of the other stakeholders, pretty much, you know, public assistance, attorneys, um, people who worked at grassroots advocacy organizations, they actually had very clear, like, political narratives that they offered to me, a very clear sense of who had power in the state, why things were the way they were, what political power Medicaid beneficiaries had. One of the things that was quite disconcerting um, at this point, I actually think some of these organizations have, I, I'm still in contact with some of these organizations and I think they've moved along from this point quite a bit. But at the point I was doing the interview for the book, I would ask people, well, given your sense of the political landscape, do you think Medicaid beneficiaries actually have any power? And these would be people who, who self-describe as being advocates, medic advocates for beneficiaries, and almost all of them would say no. They'd say, no, not really, you know, that's why we're here. And so almost sort of understanding themselves as a stand-in for beneficiaries. Um, and that's something that has changed quite a bit uh, over the last two years, I think. Some of these same organizations, because of 
the, the, the kind of observation of the, the, the potential power when Medicaid beneficiaries become involved in the process because they've seen that happen. They've seen expansion happen in places they didn't think it could ever happen, Idaho, Utah, et cetera, um, now have a different perspective on that and are much more on board with like, we need to actually think about these folks as political agents. But originally, or initially when I did the interviews, that wasn't like kind of the modal response was like, we wish they had power, it's really sad, but they're super busy and they have a lot going on in their lives and they're hard to mobilize. And like, it was a, a long explanation of all the reasons why Medicaid beneficiaries themselves couldn't really be a part of the political process. And then like, a long explanation of how crucial they were in the political process. I think that narrative has actually changed for many of those organizations. I did have a question um, in the interview instrument where I asked people if their experience with Medicaid was about similar to their experience with other government programs. I don't know what I thought going in. I thought people would say like yes or no or something. Um, but those, most people said no and I realized at some point during the course of the interview that like, oh, there's some of the interviews, that there's something interesting here. But, you know, there's a ton interesting when you get interview data. So you have, th you have um, thousands of pages of transcripts, you know. So at some point you have to focus and kind of focus on the things that, uh, that you're drawing out of it. And so I didn't, I didn't address that very much. But I've been working on a project with Carolyn Barnes, who's at Duke University at the Sanford School, and she's doing all this research on WIC, I, and I noticed something in the interviews that people would bring up WIC as a counterexample to Medicaid, and they say, well, I have WIC, I don't understand why WIC could be so great, and they treat me like a person, and they talk to me, and, and Medicaid is so horrible, and sometimes it's in the same building, sometimes it, like, the, the programs like share space, Sometimes they even have the same caseworker, and that person will literally switch over and start engaging them differently when they're dealing with their Medicaid case versus their WIC case. So when I went back and I saw this in the day, I was like, this is so interesting. And I knew that Carolyn Barnes was studying WIC. And so I said, Carolyn, here's what I'm finding. And Carolyn would said, well, I'm interviewing WIC beneficiaries, and here's what I'm finding. They're doing the same thing when they talk about Medicaid. And so we're actually doing a whole project on this now, trying to understand why people describe these things as differently as they do. Uh, with respect to housing, not much came up in the interviews proper, um, and that, might, that was likely just because I wasn't asking people about it. Um, although, you know, people talked about their neighborhoods, but they didn't talk about housing specifically. Um, however, the project that I'm working on now around medical legal partnerships, a lot of what medical legal partnerships are doing is helping people with their housing in order to stabilize their ability to receive Medicaid. And the reason that those kinds of partnerships emerged is because healthcare practitioners were like, we have all these Medicaid beneficiaries who are being evicted. And like, we can't help them with their, Medicaid, with their, with their healthcare. Like they, they can't stay on Medicaid, they're on and off as their address changes. They can't follow their medication protocol. And so at the core of, of the medical legal partnership stuff is a sort of recognition of your question. That's what, what's happening with people in the realm of housing is actually going to put a ceiling on how effective Medicaid can be in solving their health problems. And so we have to start thinking about these institutions together. So part of the, the question I ask in that project is when you think about those things together and you provide people with help, help in the realm of housing, what does it mean then for how they experience? And when they get that help, when they go for Medicaid, right? So a lot of times people are at a doctor or they're signing up for Medicaid and the partnership has a lawyer who's in-house and, and, and the caseworker realizes there's a housing problem and goes and gets the lawyer. So now Medicaid represents something different. It's where you got saved from your eviction. Does that really change these processes? All right, that is our time before we, um, give our thanks to Jamila Mitchell for coming. I uh, just wanted to let you know, this is on sale at the doors for $24. So. I didn't even know. <laughs> All right, but let's go ahead and.